Hello. Greetings, everyone. Could we uh, convene and get ready, rooted, and stay resilient? We're, we're going to start our next panel. Could I invite the, the um, panelists up? That'd be great. Thank you. Hi. Good, how are you doing? That's great. Hi, nice to meet you. Oops. <laughs> Folks, our, our panelists are, are here. They're ready to get the conversation going, so could I get everybody back to the tables? Please. Let's, we can, we can all cooperate. Please. <laughs> Again. All right, I'm just gonna start. Co cooperatives are increasingly active both in climate change adaptation and mitigation and international organizations such as the UN and its Food and Agriculture Organization recognize the important role agricultural cooperatives play in helping local farmers adopt more efficient, sustainable farming practices. Our next panel will explore why cooperatives should be an integral part to any climate strategy, especially when we consider climate justice, which many of you are familiar with and working on. Please join me in welcoming Ann Vaughn to the stage, and she's already here, um, as Senior Advisor for Climate Change at USAID's Bureau for Resilience and Food Security. Ann is here to lead us through our next panel, and thank you very much. Great, thanks. <laughs> thanks to you all. Can you hear every, oh, great mic. Um, so nice to be here with everyone. Um, as I was just introduced, I'm Ann Vaughn, and I have the pleasure of being with two great panelists today um, that will be talking about cooperatives innovating for the planet. And I understand that there's been some really exciting, energizing, energizing platform, uh, events prior to this, or panels prior to this. Well, we are tasked today with talking about the climate crisis of our generation that is impacting all of the work that you all are doing in the field, the communities that you work with, the communities that USAID works with. So we have a lot to do and a lot to cover um, in this time, but we really, really want to hear from you all first, and we're going to make this innovative, and if there's not, and there's going to be a, answers, there's going to be quizzes at the end, it's going to be very interactive, but to first start out, could you all look on your table? And you should have menti.com. If you're not familiar with this, it's super easy. Take your phone out, scan this little QR code, and you're going to use code 5802-1551, which should be on, your, um, on this little paper. And would really like you to please add very quickly what are some of the climate smart initiatives that you have seen cooperatives undertake in the US and globally. Ideally ones that work well, but if things don't work, that's also good to learn from. So please start populating that. We'll give it maybe two minutes. Procur Interesting. So climate friendly, the first one, um, and bonus points for whoever put in the first one, um, talks about climate friendly procurement policy, which is exciting because I bet that forces folks to think about what they're buying. Supply chain optimization also popped up. Anything else? Anything working with our farmers, our producers? Carbons, ooh, carbon sequestration, decarbonization of building, excellent, a lot on carbon offsets. I'd love if anyone has things on the adaptation side, like how are we helping our in cooperatives adapt to the impacts that climate is having on farmers? Regenerative ag, perfect, thank you, Silva Pastors, excellent. Ride share programs, I was not expecting that, that's awesome. Okay, so we're gonna keep these, keep them coming. Um, and yeah, if you think of other things, um, please do feel free to jump in and, and keep them going. But we're going to start with our really esteemed panelists. Um, today we have Greg Grothy and uh, Jose Julian Ramirez Ruiz. Um, Greg is from True Terra, uh, and 
Jose is the executive director at the Cooperative Investment and Development Fund, or, or FINDI Coop, I think I'm saying that right, thanks, um, in Puerto Rico. And they're also going to speak to some of these practices and other ways their organizations are encouraging the adoption of climate smart practices. Um, I have to say, both of them have, uh, between the two of them, I'm not going to date you, but over 20 plus years of working with co-ops um, internationally in different areas or in Puerto Rico um, on important things on working with private industry, government, and strengthening cooperatives. Um, so really excited to hear from you both, and we're going to kick off with the first question, um, and maybe Greg, if you want to go first. Sure. How have you seen cooperatives or uh, an association members adopt practices and technologies that serve to mitigate and or adapt to climate change? And we're looking for specific examples. Um, so first, over to you, Greg, and then we'll go to you. All right, sounds great, Anne. And yeah, thanks, thanks to the audience. I mean, all the great insights popping up um, today, you know, hopefully we can speak to some of those. They're all critically important. Um, before I give some examples, I just want to give a little background on you know, True Terra and Land O'Lakes. So, Land O'Lakes is a farmer-owned cooperative, been around for over 100 years. Um, a unique structure um, because we have two, two sides of our cooperative. One is a supply-side cooperative where our members are other agricultural cooperatives, retailers, um, who serve their growers by providing input supply data, knowledge, information. And then we have dairy farmers who are the other half of our, of our cooperative. So it's unique governance from that perspective. Um, but I wanted to share that because when I talk about some of the examples, I'm going to talk about both, both sides of that equation. Um, Shutera was formed in 2016 in large part to create a sustainable business model and create an ecosystem and market sp space for sustainable practices and catalyze um, and scale um, practice changes on farms and acres around, around the United States. So um, some examples that we've seen have been very successful on the crop side have been, you know, in particular things that enhance carbon sequestration, that reduce greenhouse gas footprints, um, cover crop adoption, tillage practices, better tillage practices, no-till, low tillage, um, better nitrogen management are three of the biggest ones that we focus on. There's a lot of other great environmentally friendly conservation practices that are out there that we also support. Um, but one, these ones we found to have uh, the most immediate marketplace um, for practice change and things that we can scale. So great. that's where we focused on for our, um, with our ag retailer network and, and our row crop producers. And on the dairy side, um, also a lot of opportunity and things that uh, our farmers have done to improve climate change mitigation. and. One of them is better manure practices. Mm -hmm. So these are very asset intensive, costly endeavors. So de-risking that and providing opportunities for farmers to invest in those is really critical. Um, exciting in the marketplace, there's a lot of new technologies coming out, um, have been out and continue to come out around enteric solutions. So additives that can be given to animals to improve their productivity and reduce um, the methane output. So, and, and then we'll not forget about so what goes into the animals, what's produced via crops is also critically important. So the practices that are done on the farm that uh, reduce that footprint are things that we've seen very successful as well. Great, thanks. Appreciate that, especially on the, the methane side, because a lot of the, the dairy and how we'd reduce methane quickly is really um, important for um, broader climate goals. So exciting things that you're working on. Jose, over to you. What do you think? Um, uh, uh, good morning, um, and thanks for the invitation. I'm very, very excited about it. Um, FIDE Co-op stands for uh, an acronym in Spanish. The, 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 the name of the, the entity can be translated as a Cooperative Investment and Development Fund. So we are um, a loan fund uh, specially dedicated for improving and you know development for cooperatives um, and um, answering your questions uh, to be honest uh, I would like to see a more urgent adoption of practices and technology in the cooperative you know among cooperative members and leaders um, 
I remember once uh, Dr. Pablo Guerra from Uruguay. He's an expert in economy of solidarity. And he once said um, that there are two main reasons to adopt socially responsible practices. The first one is you know, consciousness and education. When you really think you are doing the best for the planet, the best for the humanity and, the, and your community. And the second reason is when you have no choice. <laughs> so um, in Puerto Rico, since Hurricane Irma and Maria, the population is moving massively towards solar energy. Uh, that's, that's why um, in Puerto Rico, we had a public energy power authority, which was a public monopoly. And because of the state bankruptcy in 2015, uh, PREPA, uh, the Power Authority of Puerto Rico, decreased the grid maintenance. So when Hurricane Irma and Maria stroke in 2017, the electrical grid just collapsed. Uh, so people who have the resources are moving massively to solar power. Again, the people who have the resources or, you know, enough income to apply for a, a solar loan. And for example, from 2021 to 2022, solar loans in credit unions only increased 163% just in one year. So people are moving massively to, to solar energy. Um, since Maria, there were organized four electrical cooperatives intended especially for solar power. Um, so there's a lot of, you know, of movement uh, from the members of co-ops and, and the people towards solar energy. Again, not because they believe it's good, but because um, we need it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> I, I think that tees up the second question. We don't really have a choice in many of these climate smart practices. We need mm -hmm. to move with serious urgency um, to change what we're, doing, what we're doing, how we do it. Um, and the why almost doesn't matter anymore per, per those points. Um, so we'd love to hear from both of you. Again, um, starting, uh, starting first with Greg about what is, what's true, Trutera's uh, organizational model has facilitated the adoption of climate smart practices, and then same for, for you, Jose, um, for Fidicop. What's, what's yeah. the, yeah, how do we accelerate this? Yeah, no, thanks. Um, no, I think you know, a few things come to my mind from Trutera's perspective, and we're, we're still early as a business, so we're learning, adapting, evolving as we go, but one of the key elements and principles that we believe in as a cooperative is the focus on the farmer. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the farmer is the core of, of our business and part of what we found successful is meeting that farmer where they're at in their journey around sustainable agriculture. Because um, it is a continuum and um, having different ways to meet farmers at different points in their journey is really, has been critical to doing that. So sometimes it's starting out with a simple soil health assessment to get a better sense of what your land looks like in stewardship, and that's just the starting point all the way up to um, participating in some of the, the marketplaces for carbon where you can get um, compensated for, for those assets and the practice changes you do. So, you know, that's, that's a really key element um, for us. We also um, have really focused on three core principles that I, I think when they're combined are really powerful. How we take data, and then create insights and solutions, problem solve with growers all the time through our retail network. Um, but to do that uh, the most effectively, to me, it's, it's when you combine something that has economic value, it has agronomic value, and it has environmental value. Um, sure, this stuff can be done if we just focus on one of those three, but it, my experience, our experience has been, it's so much more powerful if you can get all three working at the same time. And so the work we do is to try to really enable those three pillars to work together in concert so you can create those different types of value. The, the last thing, or the one other thing is um, trust. It's just incredibly important to continue to build trust as a cooperative 
Um, we're fortunate to have high levels of trust between growers and our retailer networks. Survey after survey shows that growers trust their retailer more than anyone else. Um, they also trust other farmers that they're peers with. So one of the things we're doing is creating peer-to-peer -peer networks and cool. learning circles of growers to share about their, their journey in climate smart agricultural practices and you know, using that as a way to catalyze it. I want to tie back to some of the work I did the last 10 years of my career, including work with um, USAID um, and the Cooperative Development Program, because we also looked a lot at trust in places where we were doing cooperative development work in places like Rwanda, countries like Rwanda and Tanzania. And the same, same thing applied. When you can go through whatever network it is, and it's, it was different in the different countries we've, I've worked in. Um, in the US, it's, my experience has been through our retailers, but um, that trust is just absolutely critical to driving some of these, some of these changes. And then the final thing I'll say about the model is, you know, creating an ecosystem for climate smart practices for us is really connecting two, two sets of customers together. So we're, we're a retailer co-op led cooperative, <laughs> co-op of co-ops. Um, and the farmers and growers that are part of those cooperatives are customers of ours. So we call those upstream customers because they, um, they're buying the services and inputs that, w that we're, we and our retailers are selling. Um, and then there's also many, many food and ag companies have made sustainability commitments and want to improve their supply sheds and supply chains and are willing to pay, um, in some cases, for those practice changes to do that. So creating that marketplace between those two sets of customers, um, we call upstream and downstream, has been really, really impactful in the way I you know, we want to see that continued growth in that space. And I might, can I, just to be in our, keep people on their toes, can I get a show of hands on who also is thinking that in your supply chains and who your customers and upstreams are also maybe selling to supply chains or um, bigger organizations that have some of those climate commitments? We see a hands, hands. Not as many as so like, you know, sustainability things that like the Walmarts and the Targets and anybody of the big ag producers or buyers. Okay, we gotta work more on some private sector folks. Okay, cool. All right. <laughs> um, Jose, over to you also. Uh -huh. Yeah, um, as I mentioned, uh, FIDE Co-op is a um, cooperative development financial institution. We are a CDF CDFI certified and you, we are a certified USDA rural lender also. Um, but we are also a cooperative development center. And for us, it's very important not only the economical investment, but the social investment in our clients, which are cooperatives. Uh, we consider ourselves as part of a bigger a cooperative development ecosystem in Puerto Rico. Uh, we work very close to Liga de Cooperativas in Puerto Rico, and also with the Commission for Cooperative Development, which is a governmental state agency. Uh, they are in charge of incorporating co-ops. And uh, of course, with the business incubator at the Cooperative Institute in the University of Puerto Rico. So through that channel, we help grow more awareness um, on uh, cooperatives. Uh, and uh, we are working uh, in few projects. For example, we are working very close to the new uh, electrical cooperatives in the island. Uh, we have four electrical cooperatives in the island. Three of them are rural, uh, and, and they were build in their communities. Uh, for example, Piru Chocoop, which was the first one, we are providing them with technical assistance um, and guidance. Uh, there, there was, uh, Pirucho was the first rural energy cooperative in Puerto Rico back in 2019. We are also working with a Renewable Energy Management Cooperative, Ram Coop, which is a worker-owned energy co-op and they are providing, they are providing, we provide them with technical assistance uh, so they can provide services to communities and other co-ops. 
We are also working with Buena Vista Cooperative Gas Station, which is a consumer co-op, and we are helping them on creating their business plan because they want to um, have EV charge stations in their facility, so they are, they are making that, that transition. And they also have solar panels in, in their facilities. We are working, for example, with uh, Marco Op Molding, which is a worker-owned factory in the rural area, and we provide them with technical assistance applying for the USDA Rural Energy for America program, for example. And other co-ops like Abeino Co-op, that, that was the last one to be incorporated. Um, we are helping them with the USDA PACE program. And right now we are very excited about um, a new project. Uh, we, our business accelerator uh, is having uh, the, the fourth quarter right now. And we have five housing co-ops. We make uh, a memorandum of understanding with uh, Interstate Renewable Energy Council and with Inclusive Credit Union Network and um, a lot of, 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 you know, of, of other entities. So we are helping them to attend uh, this business accelerator with specific topics on microgrids, community solar, energy storage, and, follow, and photovoltaics because these communities are mostly multifamily buildings, so they need they can't afford uh, rooftop solar, for example. So that we are, you know, um, helping them on, you know, on a census for their communities. These communities are also uh, low and moderate income communities and very vulnerable because they have a lot of um, senior citizens on their apartment. And uh, right now we are doing financial, financial assistance for Cooperativa Hidroelectrica La Montaña. Um, this rural energy cooperative applied for a solar loan to cover microgrid installation in a very, very rural area in, in the mountains of Puerto Rico. And also the League of Cooperatives of Puerto Rico uh, they will be applying for a solar loan with us uh, next month, so we are very <laughs> excited about it. Um, so these are our main projects. Oh, uh, th we have a, uh, we are just uh, starting a, a new project. We call them uh, consorcio, like the word consortium, but w with the word sol, which means sun in Spanish. And we are, um, we are, uh, we want to create a second level rural electric cooperative to match funds from the government and the credit unions so we can, you know, scaffold an infrastructure for uh, creating power purchasing agreements to the low and moderate income communities. So we are crossing uh, fingers. So uh, we hope to, to make that happen next year. And I, I have to thanks to Kresge Foundation and Schmidt Foundation, which also <coughs> help us in funding this, this business project. Great, Ex exciting examples. Thank you for both specific examples of what, um, what you're doing. Um, we had this long list on our Mentimeter of climate-friendly practices earlier, and I just thank you for putting them back up again. And there's everything from um, intercropping, we heard, um, afforestation, you name it, and then these specific energy examples. Um, but what, let's, would love both of your opinions on what more we can do to accelerate this adoption of these practices, of these climate-friendly practices and technologies, and what are the challenges? Like, why is this so hard? What are the challenges that we need to overcome so we can have success, do more of what you guys are doing? And if you want to share any barriers that you face, um, we also have this nice brain trust in the room. We can, we can ask for help on this, too. But yeah. over to you. Yeah. No, appreciate that question. Um, I think, you know, to me, at the root of all of this is 
um, and, the, and the opportunity is around partnerships. Um, we're at a super exciting time in the journey around sustainable agriculture and um, I feel like every you know adoption curve that you've gone through, you know, there's there's a tipping point, right, an acceleration, and like there's there's the stories about how the U.S. started to U.S. growers started to adopt hybrid maize seed, um, you know, almost 100 years ago, and how at the very early stages it was such a small group, but within a decade it had become almost widespread, and I I feel the same way around some of these sustainable agricultural practices. Um, but to get there, it's going to require a lot of hard work, and it's going to require a lot of partnerships. Um, it's going to require some new technologies. Um, to me, you know, those are some of the really key things. And I'm super excited about partnerships in particular. You know, one, one area that we're working on in collaboration with USDA's Partnership for Climate Smart Commodities okay. is developing partnerships to do this across a broad, broad set of organizations. So we're working with some core partners, Federation of Southern Cooperatives, um, Soil Health Institute, and American Farmland Trust, amongst many others. And part of that work is to incentivize and create um, sustainable structures for producers to adapt practice changes, including those that are historically underserved, um, large and small growers um, around the United States. So uh, to me, those types of partnerships can be really powerful, working across public sectors, working across NGOs, academic, um, and private sector. When you can bind all four of those or a subset of that, it's super powerful. And that's what I see in my career, you know, whether it's been with TrueTerra or with Venture 37 or you know, other, other jobs that I've had. So I'm really passionate about partnerships. They're challenging. Um, you know, we all don't think the same, and that's okay. Um, and that's important to, you know, to recognize, but I think the ability to combine the best thinking that's out there to achieve some of these um, objectives is, is what's going to help us be successful. And we can do that when it's also enabled by new types of programs, services, technologies that are out there. So I'm also equally excited by some of the innovations that are happening that are going to make that pyramid I talked about, the economic, agronomic, yeah. and environmental incentives align. Great. If I could put a plug in just on partnerships, um, I think many of you might be familiar with the Agricultural Innovation Mission for Climate, or aim for c that's an initiative led by the US and the UAE uh, that's got 50 plus countries on board now, and I think we're over about 800 partners that are looking to invest more in climate smart research development and innovation. And it's a great opportunity to get private sector, public sector, academia together to try to address specifically food system problems. But would encourage folks to check that out because it is a great partnership platform um, uh, that focuses a lot on the climate side of things. So, Jose, over to you. Well, um, the biggest challenge in Puerto Rico is our territory condition. Um, uh, Puerto Rico, in Puerto Rico, we are uh, a territory of the U.S. We belong to the U.S., but we are not part of it. So, for example, if we want to take advantage of the renewable tax, energy tax credits for renewable energy projects for low and moderate income communities, that's, that's a big challenge. We won't have the same legal treatment no matter Puerto Rico's burn residents are U.S. citizens. So, um, there's a lot of opportunities in the Infl Inflation Reduction Act, but when you try to apply it to uh, Puerto Rico as a new U.S. territory, they don't work the same as in the mainland. We are dealing with that ambiguity right now with the Project Consolcia, for example, and because we want to organize this second level uh, energy cooperative to offer PPAs and, and lease for low and moderate income communities. So to match funds from the U.S. federal government and investment from the cooperative movement, we are trying to, you know, uh, create these second level cooperatives and, and use uh, tax credit, uh, specifically uh, renewable energy tax credit, but we are just trying to look a way to, to use this kind of, you know, tool for improving the lives of a lot of people in, in Puerto Rico. Thank you. Um, all right, folks. Uh, I said there was going to be a quiz at the end. 
it's more we're actually we're gonna have our we're gonna flip the script a little bit and have our panelists ask you all questions. Um, you get points if you answer correctly or incorrectly. There's no there's no judgment on any of this. Um, and we'll have two gentlemen who have offered to be our mic guys right here, one and two in the back. So let's start first, Greg, with you. What question would you like the audience to to answer today? Yeah. Well. First of all, I was so excited to hear that the format was going to have us ask questions to the audience. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, <laughs> they asked me to be part of a panel that had that. I was like, yes, sign me up. Um, but you know, I, I think the panel before us talked about a lot of really important issues. Um, partnerships came up, and I'm very passionate about partnerships as well. And mentioned that, but I'm very interested in what our our audience thinks of where they've seen partnerships be most effective. Like, what kinds of partnerships have you seen that have been catalytic for change in your industry or sector work. Anybody going? We start, I'm going to start calling on people if people don't raise their hand. Oh, uh, I got a hand. Oh, sorry. Hello. Hello. Hi. I can see you now. Um, I'm sassy, lovely to see y'all. Um, and I, one thing that I've seen, so I'm a part of an LCA right now, a new multi-stakeholder co-op, and so we're working, it's called Zebras Unite. It's trying to work in the in the entrepreneurial ecosystem. And so we're trying to connect investors, institutional partners, and founders of various companies that are attempting to be zebras, which is basically their way of saying co-ops um, and social, social mutualistic organizations. So we're trying to actually integrate those, basically the whole supply chain of the founder and entrepreneurial ecosystem inside one cooperative. It's going interestingly. Um, there are some tensions, but it's one thing that's really, really powerful is having those folks and have their representatives all on one board and have to come together on one board and make decisions mm -hmm. at that level in a bylaws mandated fashion. Mm -hmm. So that's interesting. We'll let you know how it goes. <laughs> Thank you. Up here in the front. Hi, I'm Anna. I wear many hats here when I sit in the table, but uh, the one I am answering with is that I'm in the ICA Youth Rep in the ICA board, and I run the committee, and we're running a very low budget every year, 5,000 a year. Uh, so partnerships that actually support organizations that want to impact in youth, and instead of doing them alone in one hand, uh, decide that they want to partner with the youth committee, uh, bring their resources or the ideas to make things possible and enlarge the impact at the global level are super helpful. And actually, there's many uh, people the, from the youth committee here today because thanks to a partnership, uh, we have been able to bring a group for the second time as an exchange program for youth. So I think these kind of things really impact on, on the scale uh, and really understanding of the cooperative movement at the global level. So if any people and uh, institutions wants to you know, partner in terms of youth, the fact that you reach out to a youth committee that is very underfunded, it always enlarges impact with many, many less resources that you would do doing it alone. So that has been super good. Great. Any, uh, oh, great, over here. Mic check. Mic check, mic check. Hi. Hola, Jose. Gracias por la sabiduría. Um, my name is Joel, ICA group and founding member of Me or My Farms. I would say that I really am invested in intergenerational and intersectional collaboration and partnerships. Um, intergenerational because we need the young people talking to the older people and vice versa. I'm highly committed to the idea of modeling and mentoring. So that's like a two-way exchange there. And intersectionally, because I think we need to understand how we all can collaborate. The secondary call model is a great way to show that for sure. But I think both of those are my focus, at least, for the foreseeable future. Thank you. Very cool. Thank you. Um, JT here with Symbiop. Uh, we work in ecological uh, sectors. Um, so I, I'm, I'm not going to answer your question, so to speak, <laughs> but I'm going to tell you where investment would have the biggest impact, okay. specifically in ecological industries. Um, what I have seen is there is a shortage of um, skilled labor 
uh, there's lots of training in ground level worker, people, plenty of people who want to get into it. And I'm talking about skilled worker in terms of like management level worker. Like, there, like if there's investment that can be going into highly subsidized training for managers, for entrepreneurs, that will be great on top of capitals, of course. Um, yeah. Thanks. You're getting some snaps. Um, other answers to this? And I would, oh, please, yeah, over here. Uh, hi, I'm CJ Acosta, Executive Director of Pro Café, Productores de Café de Puerto Rico. Uh, we are an organization that represents over 500 coffee producers in Puerto Rico and other segments of the industry, millers, toasters, everybody. But the weight of the vote through the bylaws is on the producers, right? So the idea I, I think that I've seen work is the collaboration. Even though many of my members might have some sort of competition with each other, they, through our, this organization, channel resources for the industry and show up together uh, at the table when, when they want something accomplished. And I think that's very, very powerful. And we don't have a lot of that in Puerto Rico. We have a lot of everybody pulling to their own side. And this organization is the first one that I've seen that actually uh, brings together uh, such powerful players in one single voice. And at the, end, at the same time, channels both co-op help, because we do behave like a co-op, and it also channels philanthropy and all sorts of resources. And because of the way it's organized, the organization itself will never compete with its own members, right? So it's kind of, it's a well thought out uh, scheme that I think should be transported to other industries, not just coffee, right? So it, it's a, it's a, I think that's the best example I've seen. Great. I'm, I might turn to Jose for, to ask a question, but would love to riff a little bit off of that because just thinking about coffee, the impact climate change is gonna have on coffee in many parts of the world. If I have any chocolate producers or representatives, chocolate's gonna be very impacted in many parts of the world. I would love to think how cooperatives are also thinking about who do you need to partner with to get the right information about the longevity of certain commodities in different regions, and how do we support producers along those ways? So happy to talk sidebar chat and share information on, on partnerships we have with NASA and what have you, but just also keep in mind what are the what, what, world's gonna look different in ten years. How are we preparing our our communities and our and our and our partnerships for, for that that's coming because it's it's gonna be a different world in a bit. But um, not to not to bring us down a little bit, but maybe Jose bring us back up. What what question do you have for the audience? Well uh, I would like to know <clears throat> your experience on um, Investing in uh, renewable energy. Um, I want just to heard a little bit about it. Maybe in your co-ops or in your associations or entities. Oh my God. There's no renewable. There has to be. We have the IRA. Oh, please. There we go. <laughs> Hello. Um, so yeah, I work for a worker-owned cooperative in Madison. Um, one of our big things was we invested in solar for our business, um, and a big uh, initiative was also going through and finding energy savings through uh, LED replacements, um, you know, more efficient manufacturing processes, um, packaging materials, stuff like that. Um, and a big push was to make it more personal, and so on individual levels, people were encouraged to do that at home too. So a lot of families at home, um, I know a handful of people that put solar on our houses, um, implemented practices of sustainability at home with our families and friends and in the communities, so. Great, thanks. That one over here. Hi. Um, uh, we, we helped to form a, an investment cooperative for renewable energy. Uh, uh, working with uh, a large building owner who had the space to do it so the investors um, get the income from the electricity which is um, supplied to the building owner and it's big enough to make that work. It's slow money but it's positive money so uh, that's one thing we did. Very cool. I think we had a point up here on the front table. And I like that slow money, but good money. What was that? That's a very, it, yeah. Hi. Um, 
One example I have in a role that I hold in the past was that uh, we supported uh, a company that was developing a solar refrigerator to store food for farmers in rural areas in uh, East Africa. And uh, that model, the purpose was to scale it uh, across the region. And um, it, that particular project was um, not only performed by the company, but also um, a collaborating and developing the model with other producers in Asia. So there was like a lot of uh, developing and testing and whatnot. But uh, they were not the first ones that are, they were developing these um, solar refrigerators. However, they were bringing it to a very lower cost. So it would be um, affordable for, for rural uh, farmers. Fantastic. And Friday was the Reducing Food Loss, International Day for Reducing Food Loss and Waste last Friday, and that helps contribute to that. So that's a... Thank you. My name is Willie. I'm from Rwanda, in East Africa. I want to answer the question from Greg earlier around the partnerships and talk about uh, what I see as a catalytic power of uh, secondary tier uh, cooperative uh, structures. Uh, for us, we are supporting uh, agricultural farmer owned cooperatives uh, with Land of X Venture 37, trying to transform them into uh, profitable and uh, professional businesses. So those farmer cooperatives really uh, are lacking so many services. Uh, they, they need finance, they need uh, business advisory, they need uh, to name it so, so much more. So I do believe that uh, in terms of partnerships, these are uh, uh, secondary tier uh, uh, structures or national level type of structures are very critical to kind of pull together all these uh, uh, business uh, business actors to, to support cooperatives in, uh, in one go. Oh, thank you. Any other questions? Do we have questions from the audience for the panel or I might ask a, a couple of main questions. Oh no, please go ahead. Yeah, good. Uh, good morning, Jose Luis Rojas from LEAF, Local Enterprise Assistance Fund. Um, so we're not, we haven't done renewable energy per se, but we have been working with uh, recycling materials. So we are funding, uh, we have fi financed a cooperative that recycles oil from restaurants and also a biodigester that uses, uh, yeah, again, oils to, to, to produce energy. And can I ask, why, why did you guys do that? What made you decide to go into that? Was there financial incentives, or you saw the need for it? We're, we're a CDFI, so we, yeah, so we're financing them, but neither project is an easy project. Yeah. So it was hard for them to get funding. Yeah. And we just played a small part, but just trying to help them achieve their vision. Great. And that's maybe a question for the, the crowd, too. What are some of those challenges? Why is it hard to maybe lean in as much as you'd like on climate smart practices and climate smart changes that are facing your community, or if there's no impacts on your community on climate change, that'd be great to know. We can bring, you know, not be so depressed about the state of the world. But what other, what are some of the barriers? Many of the questions we'd asked the panelists earlier. What do you find barriers to working more on impacts that are facing your, your co-ops? Over. Yeah, Dave Carter, uh, Flower Hill Institute. We do technical assistance for meat and poultry processors. Hi, Jose. Want to talk to you in a bit. Um, through the years that I've worked primarily in agriculture and the livestock sector, you have so many producers out there, ranchers, farmers, that are dedicated to climate smart practices and regenerative practices, and I, I particularly see this in the livestock sector. There is a growing number of consumers that are basing their purchasing decisions on ESG, on environmental social you know, responsibility. The problem is the traditional infrastructure is a barrier from connecting those producers with those consumers. And that's where I see the cooperative model as being um, the ideal for helping, rather than having that sort of adversarial relationship between producers and, and shoppers, is that we can develop those enterprises that can help get those climate smart commodities to those people that want to buy them through the cooperative model. Super, like super that. helpful. Yeah, yeah. Other thoughts on challenges that you're facing or super successes? I 
think some that sort of gets a lab makes me think of labeling, which I know can be not the easiest thing to do. But how do we how, how do we have that education between between folks? Any other challenges that folks want to share our workshop? Or if everything's going great, then we can uh, we can end a minute a whole minute early with nope nothing. Oh, please over here. One last one last. That'll be our last. Last comment question. Hi, this is Leslie. Uh, I'm with MRN Village, and I've done work from farmer to farmer for probably 20 years. And what I find is one of the issues, and hopefully you can answer this for me, how do you assess who's going to be a good partner mm -hmm. to your organization. Because that's one of the training pieces that I have to do with so many of the co-ops and communities and colleges and universities I work with, is that they want to grab the first person who says, can we be a partner? And they don't understand that you have to go through an assessment process because you buy their history, OK? And they buy yours. And do you have a cooperative working relationship? So, gentlemen, you have a lot of experience doing this. So how do you do that? Yeah, it's a great question. And I mean, to me, it's about, you know, it starts with values. So we are very, you know, I think, one, the employees understand what those values are of the organization. And then two, that when you go in a partnership discussion, you have open conversations about that. And you have that process, like you said, of understand where there's those mutual values um, and where you can move forward together and you know in cooperation so um, it does take time to build trust you know some sometimes that can take months and years to do so um, you know I've learned every organization that we partner with have a different cadence right of how that partnership can evolve and develop so it takes some patience and persistency sometimes but I think that openness up front to understand your values is like the core foundation of it. Yeah, Jose. Um, <clears throat> uh, first of all, I think it has to do with being humble, knowing where is your lack of knowledge and experience. And the other thing is to be less afraid of paying back that help. Because maybe one of the difficult things of you know the, the mutual help is that you have to stop being afraid and be more humble. And you have to say to yourself, OK, someone helped me. Now I have a debt to that person, or I have a debt to that organization. So uh, it, it has to do with you know your consciousness and 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 being okay to to have you know this kind of uh, you you have to write a paycheck to someone and for another organization that's helping you, and you have to have a, a, your memory uh, for this organization or this person, so you, you have to pay back that, that, that help. I think that is a, a beautiful and eloquent way to, to end the panel. So I just want to really thank our panelists for their, their brilliant contributions. You all passed the quiz. Um, and thank you for your engagements. Um, but think that partnership um, and thoughts and also buying your history, but also how do we think about innovating for the future and innovating for the planet? We do have a lot of new challenges. Um, that we know our, our, our teams and our communities are going to face. So I hope we can build off some of these partnerships um, and do them the right way um, with humility uh, as we go forward. So huge thanks to, to you all and for the audience. <laughs> for